This podcast is part of the Michigan Sports and Entertainment Podcast Network. Go to michigansportsandentertainment.com for more great podcasts. Welcome to Things I Found Online. T-I-F-O. T-F-O. Yes, <laughs> T-F-O. Today, with Lori Roggenkamp, yes. our guest, Kennedy Phillips, and I'm Jamie Alcroft, with our hostess, Louise. Thanks, Jamie. You got that was it. outstanding. Take a deep breath. I am. Uh, I our guest like is Kennedy Phillips. Please I welcome already. Kennedy. Hi, Kennedy. <laughs> And Yay. a round of applause. Thank you for you're watching coming. at Thank home. You. Stop driving momentarily and give him a round of applause. So, Kennedy, uh, to initiate our guest, what we do is we Google you because our show Uh-oh. is called Things I Found Online. So we need to find you online. Otherwise, we can't authenticate your existence. You're being, can, can you feel it? Could you go to kennedyphillips.org? Ooh, dot if it's org. that small oh, tingling sensation it, in the back it, of my neck, I it, think that it, might be anxiety, but it, don't it quote be, me on that. Yeah, it could be it an could alien be. visitation. Or an, the exterminator is due. Oh, no. good. It's it's this page. It, I'm Phillips. so glad it's this and not <laughs> anything else. <laughs> Edit. Pages you've been visiting lately. Edit sound, voice, and nonsense. I like how you had... Like legit things and then a silly thing. Nonsense is a commodity, you know. Okay, yeah, absolutely. Okay. I mean, that's what Seinfeld was based off of. So you know. No, he was. That was nothing. That oh, was nothing. I yeah. think there's nonsense. a difference between nonsense yeah. and not a thing. Oh, so sorry. Kennedy, describe yourself. How would if someone said to you at a party, "Hey, Kennedy, nice to meet you. What do you do?" I bang pots together for a living. Uh, no, the uh, <laughs> what, what I do is I do um, uh, I do editing, I do sound design, I do foley art, I do voice acting. Uh, In this day and age, freelance is kind of a big thing. Uh, So I usually jump on anything from short films to feature length movies to uh, cartoons and other things like that. So you you can't keep the job. It's more that like I finish (laughs) my jobs. It's more that you finish your job. You come in, you work for maybe about like two or three weeks, and then you're done. Isn't that wonderful? And then you move on to the next project. I've worked with uh, DreamWorks TV. I've worked with uh, the Uh, Jim Henson Company. Um, I'm working on a feature right now while I'm doing this Magus Elgar thing. Uh, as as a video editor, um, wait, did you just say Magus Elgar? Yes, that is correct. I think we I need did to, mention Magus Elgar. We need to hear more about that because you brought. Uh, oh. I brought these little postcard things because you know Ooh. I apparently learned all of my advertising in the 1980s. Yeah, <laughs> that's very impressive. The you, graphics, the graphics this, are outstanding. Do really you really have a mall table. kiosk? You and improv groups are the you know, only ones I, still I, printing out postcards. I, I do have a poster board, <laughs> okay. but like I, I, uh, it's it's still sitting in my room, and I'm not sure what to do with it. I think I'm you thinking, hang it in your room. I, I'm thinking I might I might like uh, put it, put it up when I if if I ever go to like a convention or anything like yeah. that. But I've got like I've got like a nice poster of the first season in my office. Which is nice. Mm-hmm. There are still things that That's are handy fun. to have in case we ever walk out into the real world. Well, I mean, handy nothing. It's more of just like I made a movie. This is and, and yeah, <laughs> this is what you did. You just you're just so proud of what you did, and you put so much of your heart and soul into it. I'm sure. So it's, who is it's, Magus? It's fantastic. Yeah, it's fantastic. Who is Magus, and would we want to know him? Uh, Magus Elgar is uh, a magical troubleshooter. He's uh, a something called a caster, a person with magical potential that uh, casts spells, magic, and so on and so forth. Think of like uh, Merlin or Harry Potter or Dumbledore. Or oh, we that. have those today. They're called influencers. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, his his whole thing is that he travels the world of Hearth to troubleshoot uh, magical anomalies and other strange things that happen. Oh. And uh, he and his apprentice Udo uh, end up in discovering this mysterious artifact called the Mirror Cauldron, which uh, allows them to explore completely new dimensions that were unbeknownst to their to their kind. So they see things and, differently. Well, it's more that they 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 end up. Uh, Doing the responsible thing by casting wild magic indiscriminately into the, into the portal, and end up in our world, uh, the world of Earth, and they meet uh, two quantum scientists, and accidentally blow up their house. Uh, <laughs> oh. Isn't that always the case? Yeah. So the whole story is about um, safety first. Those, yeah. Quantum well, scientists. So the whole story is about Magus Elgar and his colleagues uh, searching the world of Hearth for stamps. Scientific tools augmented with magical power, Ooh. because the because uh, the quantum scientist Doctor Horatio's house exploded, mm-hmm. or more accurately, 
imploded. Okay. Oh, okay. All of his tools, all of his scientific equipment exploded into Hearth. And they've taken on magical properties because science isn't a thing in the world of Hearth. Oh, okay. It's just the way things are. That's just how things are. We're yeah. like, with Earth, we have science. Right. right. And with Hearth, they have magic. Magic. Okay. So oh. the, the, the powers that be called the elements, these abstract concepts of, of various magical uh, things, uh, try to make sense of these scientific tools by giving them magical properties. Knowing about as much as a third grader trying to read a calculus book. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so right. we have we have things like uh, for for us a radio which just broadcasts like uh, recordings all over, mm-hmm. such as like right now using maybe. radio waves. Very similar, using radio very waves. Yeah. Um, start uh, their interpretation of it is that it starts speaking to the dead, <laughs> or uh, or they they one of the first ones they run into a scalpel which uh, turns into like this tiny little laser sword thing. Because it's like, oh well, this this like is very very sharp and just cuts through everything. Yeah, that, that makes sense, right? <laughs> so but, does science seem magical to people who are used to magic? Uh, in in a couple of senses, yeah, it just seems like a different kind of magic. Mm-hmm. It's like okay. a Harry Potter, Mr. Weasley's character, who's constantly like. <sighs> <laughs> oh no! Did I say something wrong? <laughs> no, it's it's more of like I I listen to that conversation and you I immediately get concerned for everybody in Harry Potter being like, how are they going to blend into society? <laughs> like this this man is is overwhelmed by the concept of of uh, a telegraph and i'm like aren't they in a time where like cell phones are a thing this yeah. is oh dear yes. <laughs> yeah yeah you, mean... won- you wonder what the children in the the wonderful school of hogwarts are teaching for for being an adult yes. in the muggle world the like, yeah. i don't think they have magic taxes at hogwarts yeah. they don't yeah. have that class and also <laughs> can i just add that hogwarts is the most dangerous school you could ever send your child to there's I, at least I, one kid who dies every year well, actually, i would argue there's charles never a lawsuit i would ex- argue charles xavier's school for the gifted because that that building explodes fairly frequently. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's true. They also have a fighter jet underneath the building, <laughs> underneath the basketball court. Feel like I need to point that one out. Yeah. yeah. And 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 even just Quidditch alone. You know, there's not proper safety equipment. No. Not really. You that's go. a really. dangerous you sport. Neither, neither does hands. rugby, but that doesn't stop you from watching yeah. it, does it? <laughs> I mean, technically the Russian uh Hogwarts was the worst school because that one kept getting what was it? It went underwater or something like that, didn't it? Or maybe I don't know. Somebody from Harry Potter is going to be like, "You're an idiot." <laughs> um, yeah, you can you can write to us, Potter fans. Yeah. We know yeah, yeah, yeah. Harry Potter. All four. We Potter have enough fans. information to be dangerous. Uh, so, what inspired Magus? And and tell us about the creation. And it's it's an audio book. Like, if you were to describe, what's the what's the media? What's the medium? You would say it's an audio book. I would say it's an audio drama. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. An audio book is usually. Excuse me. Mm-hmm. An audiobook is usually one person uh, narrating a story and uh, taking you through this by description alone. There's no music, there's no sound effects, right, it's not just frequently just like that. reading the book. Mm-hmm. Like Jim Dale talking about how Harry had lived under the stairs and it was a good life except when it was bad, such as when the Dursleys came in, knocked on the door and said, we have fed you dog food. You will yeah. be happy and be grateful that yeah. we have taken you under our wing. I know. Um, <laughs> also, it's like Dumbledore well should have been checking well in. Put. You know, I mean, yeah, it's like, we can keep going back to this. Yeah, but, but, I mean, can. but for audio dramas, audio dramas have the freedom of having a lot more production value behind mm-hmm. it. You have a full cast of characters. You have full full. Actors. Oh, okay. So it's kind of like you a have, radio play, like War exactly, of the Worlds. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you have you have lots of sound design. You have music and everything like that. It's almost like watching a movie with your eyes closed. Oh, okay. Um, now, of course, there's a lot of things in audio that you kind of have to do, do to make sure that everything uh, tracks well for the audience. Like you kind of have to describe what's happening mm-hmm. or have enough sound design for you to be able to understand what's happening. Um, That's cool. I, I grew yeah, I like up that. with like a that. lot of these audio dramas when I was a kid. Well, probably one of my favorites is like my my kindergarten teacher at a Montessori school had this ca- big cardboard box with like uh, glow in the dark lights and stuff like that. It's all really dark. You go inside and she played a tape 
that would describe you lifting off in a rocket and then landing on the moon mm. and you're walking around and oh, with cool. with your eyes closed or with the glow in the dark stars and everywhere mm. your imagination just sets ablaze yeah uh, fantastic and Ray and Montessori. i I, I uh, in college I, I listened to a couple of these uh, audio dramas. One in particular I loved was called Professor Nebulous, which was a parody of Doctor Who, made uh, made in part by the voice of the Daleks. Oh, which is such a weird thing. Yeah, that is um, true. but it was it was it was hilarious. I, I yeah. loved every second of it, and they had like maybe uh, 15, 16 episodes, wow. and I, I watched yeah. them on repeat constantly while I was at college. I made my own little cruddy audio drama uh, for myself um, that has been lost to the annals of the internet somewhere on there. I don't encourage you to look it up. Please don't. <laughs> it's, it's, not your uh, it's not the annals of the internet. Yeah. It's the annals of the internet. <laughs> Uh, yes. it, it was terrible because uh, it was just me recording with no, my voice. No, it's anal's because it was crappy. Is it, so. uh, <laughs> it on your live journal? No, I, I never had any of those. I didn't really have a, a social media until really late. And even then it was put in there under protest because my parents were like, you're going to make it big. We made a Facebook for you. Are and you I'm like, serious? I didn't want this. Oh, my God. <laughs> Wow. And now I'm the only one in my family that still has one because of work. Yeah. Um, do, you have, do you have a MySpace? I do not. No. Okay. Um, <laughs> no, but um, no, she I didn't set that up for you. With okay. Magus Elgar himself as a character, mm -hmm. um, it was said a long time ago uh, when I was in high school, they, they talk about how we all wear masks, aspects of our personalities that we project ourselves for any different scenario, such as the one that I'm putting on right now. Mm -hmm which is completely different than when I'm in a group setting with about 50 plus people, in which case I become a wallflower a little bit and just kind of get all flustered. Like, oh, mm, it's, it's nice to meet you're you. Cut, yeah. <laughs> your cutoff number is 50? Uh, in that ballpark. <laughs> okay. uh, all right. but the, um, now we know. We know next yeah, time. Yeah, but with yeah, these yeah. different masks. All I need is two. <laughs> yeah. You, you overcharge aspects of your identity. Yeah. Little pieces of yourself that... Yeah. You can you can play like levels. Right. What I did for my for my big foray into directing for the first time with this show, uh, the, I'm gesturing at this thing, uh, was I was taking a lot of these characters and overcharging aspects of my personality, oh. uh, just just to play with. It's like a a, a, a playground That's to experiment cool. with the different mm -hmm. characters I have. Now, of course, mm -hmm. I there are people that I take a lot of inspiration from uh, in real life. Like any any good writer yeah. would, but with Magus Elgar, particularly the part that I was amplifying was the 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 childlike wonder and excitement that I have in my work and all things that I do. Yeah, um, which in part also comes off like a bit of a goober, um, mostly because a lot of times when I get really excited about explaining something, a lot of my uh, terminology and um, my vocabulary starts getting scrambled. Yeah, but uh, that happens, I think, with everybody. So, well, yeah. like, but uh, I think enthusiasm is contagious, and I think it's wonderful. Yeah. And I love people who are passionate about anything. Yeah. I don't have yeah. to share their interest in the oh, green yeah. moth beetle or whatever, but if they're excited about it, that makes me so happy. One of my favorite Oops. things to do is to watch documentaries on things that I could care less about, right. but that people love. They because, get so into it. Yeah, because it's like it's almost like you're like, oh, that's great that that person, you know, I watched a whole documentary on Legos, and I loved it, but I mean, I have zero interest in Legos. playing with Legos. Yeah. Or, or you're not good with them? No. They I, challenging? Yeah, no. No, I black out, and then I just swallow just, I do the wee blows. <laughs> I can do the wee blows. Oh, that sounds problematic. Oh, <laughs> Yeah. But those are the bigger ones, right? It's an under clothes. I, do do I, do I don't even know the name of like giant block. We have you can always go with stickle bricks or Lego or uh, Tinker Toys. I Lincoln grew up with Logs. Tinker toys I myself. could never really make right, anything yeah. other than like the cabin. In yeah, my, in, I made yeah. a cabin, and then you again. would destroy it, right? Cause, I, made an yeah. out, I made an outhouse. Did you? Yeah. <laughs> it's just out of necessity. So yeah. there's this show <laughs> out of necessity. Yeah. Thank God. Was that in the annals of your creativity? It was. It was. Well, there's this show. Yeah. I don't know what channel it was on because my husband and I were out of town and the TV comes on and you don't really realize what channels they get until you're watching a show called Long Cabin. <laughs> oh. Long oh, Cabin. Yeah. And you watch it way into the night for no apparent reason. Every episode is a couple looking for a log, a log cabin. cabin. 
and they show them, this is the most simple, it costs them 79 cents to make an episode, Jamie. They show this couple <laughs> three log cabins, the couple buys a cabin and moves into a cabin. Nothing else happens. Is but it the, the same trick, couple? No, it's always a different couple. <laughs> it's the trick the same is, couple. It's always the same line. Make, I really you know, we've, to be the we've same lived couple. here for <laughs> we've lived here for approximately thirty five <laughs> days, and I, yeah. you know the sunlight yeah. is just not hitting it in the right. So we're going to sell and start over. Yeah. My husband has many many complaints about this. I do. But I'm not happy, happy at all. Too many not happy locks in this cabin. It's yes. called the Goldilocks. Cabin. So they, Too many damn well, logs. This is the trick. This is Too the programming trick. I'm going to pass it on to right. everybody the, the makers of log cabin have have mastered this what you do is you start the next episode without a commercial break all of a sudden new couple Boom. new cabin search and Boom. you're like well now okay I'm, I'm, in. I'm in <laughs> it's compelling yeah it's 4 30 we we have to know whether or not they, they find the right cat. I mean, it's a step up from the evolution uh, of reality television back in the day, where their idea of uh, getting you excited for the next commercial, uh, the next uh, episode—I said commercial—is yeah. uh, as the credits are rolling. In this next episode, while they find their their new special starlight home, a baby will be set on fire. <laughs> will this baby survive? Tune in. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. See, I just can't approve of that. They do that sometimes, still with like setting babies on fire. No, thirty yeah. percent of the time, it wasn't a real baby. So really. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> 70%, 70% there were so, some babies that were hurt. So passion. So anything that makes you go, I, I can't look away. Or mm -hmm. I have to keep talking about this. Or mm -hmm. if you're explaining something to Thomas and he, you see him getting excited about what you're excited about. That's yeah. what... He's getting that, excited. That's yeah. what fuels humans. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sharing our interests. Yeah. We were talking about this before the show. Desire. Yeah. Right. Desire and passion, desire. I mean, what makes you get up in the morning? A desire to live your life, a desire to, to yeah. be with the person you love, a desire to do this, a desire to do that. Pancakes. A desire to be better. You, you, pancakes. You desire to aspire. Better pancakes. That would be, that pancakes. Would be that, that's the first uh, lady's next program. Desire to aspire. Well, it's, <laughs> it's better English than be best. Be best. So, I know. <laughs> So Jamie and I were t discussing desire and passion, and I think yeah. I think it it is a goes more to powerful fuel than any search for money. Yeah, it goes it, to this. And what if you, you did. look back at your life about why you chose what you chose, it's generally more passion than it was money. We need enough money, but you lived on a boat, so you know that oh, I can I can live on a boat, and then I can do what I love. I mean, what? What fueled you or inspired you to live on a boat? Was it so that you could save money, pare down, and and do what you what interests you? Well, uh, for those of you that don't know, uh, I lived on a sailboat for about twelve years. Wow! Um, from age zero to age twelve. If we go oh, like so that, wasn't... In, if we go like this, so does it make you feel alone? Most of that was not my choice. I have well, a the show. Bounce, it's not the bouncing. I have it's a more show. Of like the rocking Log sailboat. <laughs> Log <laughs> cabin for... sailboats. This uh, couple uh, has to find. Their dream oh, wow. log sailboats. So, anyway, anyway, go ahead. So, um, anyway, you were raised on a boat. I, I did not. I didn't really Essentially. have much of a say in, in right. being yeah. raised on this boat. However, uh, what my parents had done is that they chose the boat because, in part, they loved sailing. Yeah. But also, in part, that it's actually really cheap to get rent for a boat back yeah. in the 90s in Florida. A uh, Where while in they, Florida? Um, Fort Lauderdale. Fort Lauderdale. Uh, right. At the time. Um, Everywhere, my parents, it's a boat. My parents worked yeah. as... Um, hey, hey, Kennedy, just scoot a little t closer to the mic. Oh, yeah. yeah. Talk really close to the mic. Is, is that much better? Oh, I apologize. Much better. I'm sorry. Much better. Um, no, my, par my parents had uh, grown up... At, well, they were, they were working as um, nurses in hospitals, and they went on to home health nursing. Mm -hmm. Okay. And living on the boat allowed us to really consolidate a lot of our resources... We weren't dealing with a mortgage. Right. Um, we leased, they, they leased their cars. Yeah. And if they wanted to go out for like a trip, they could just take a day sail and just like yeah, sail around, true. sail around Florida for a bit. Um, but a lot of that allowed them to really narrow down a lot of the costs of day-to-day -day life and permit them to save up for the important things for themselves. Case in point, uh, every year, they would take time to take like a week or two weeks in Switzerland and go skiing for a little bit, and they would put like a lot of their savings mm -hmm. into making that happen. They'd just leave you on the boat? No, I would go with them. Okay, good. Uh, oh. I, I actually a lot of uh, it, they sailed as, to Switzerland. <laughs> as as absolutely privileged as this sounds, and I'm sorry about no, this. Right. Uh, I I learned how to ski in Switzerland, and most of my skiing wow, experience was in Switzerland. That's amazing. Um, that's great. Um, 
But I think the one bit that really showed where my parents' priorities were in terms of the passion for their lives was when I was eight years old, they, they called to me and my sister to come to the stern of the ship where, they were, where their beds were and all that. They sat us down. They said, we want to join the Expo 98 Round the World Rally, what? and we want to sail around the world. Oh, wow. How, how big was the ship, the boat? 50 foot. It was a 50 foot Gulf Star. It was a sailboat that also had an engine in it. Okay. Um, and our entire life was in this boat. Wow. We did not have any house or anything like that. We had a dock and yeah. we had some wonderful friends that were in yeah. the dock. I knew a lot of people So they, they, West, they told the us, boats. you have the opportunity. Mm -hmm. Well, we, you, we are asking you, do you want to come with us wow. or do you want to stay? Wow. If you stay, we'll have you spend. We'll we'll have you go and live with grandma or one of our aunts or something like that. And you'll get your schooling. We'll be back in maybe like a year and a half, or we'll be dead. We're not sure. <laughs> oh boy! Did they throw um, that in? Really? No, no. But, um, I didn't think so. <laughs> but but that was going through your head. Yeah. But my immediate thought is, why would I say no? Right. Why would what? anyone say no to right. going around the world? Uh, to to sailing around the world. That mm -hmm. is a, a an opportunity you would never be able to get again. Mm -hmm. So I you know, I, I emphatically said yes. My sister emphatically said yes. And we worked for the next couple of months filling our boat with as much soda and canned goods as we could. Mm -hmm. <laughs> which lasted about three weeks. Okay. I, <laughs> Um, but yeah, we, uh, in nine, 97, 98, we sailed around the world. Wow. Um, you know, there were ups and downs. We, we nearly died a couple of times. Um, because but, of the high seas or storms, among storms. other things, storms. Or just um, family fighting. No, uh, <laughs> mo mo mostly, well, you know how it gets to be on a boat. Yeah. yeah. Mostly <laughs> be my risks family. that you wouldn't anticipate going out to sea. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. Like, you know, there, there's like man of war, there's rogue coral reefs, there's running aground, there's Jeez. pirates, yeah. there's getting struck by the pirates. same monsoon twice. You went right past pirates, pirates. back it up. Pirates? pirates? <laughs> well, I mean, man of war, I feel like, was pretty crazy too. Pretty, pretty bad. <laughs> pirates! I want to hear about pirates Lori. too. Pirates. Oh, okay, uh, okay right, so sense. like um, this this one instance, it always keeps coming back to this one, because it's all, as soon as you hear pirates, it's like, oh, you think of the yar. No, no, no! Shiver I, I think of Somalia no, and Tom oh, Hanks pirates. I am the captain now. <laughs> well, the, we were in we were in the middle of the Lilla. We were in the middle of the Pacific, okay. and we get a call from uh, the radio. Okay. Uh, the way the shortwave radios work is that there's only like a certain range that they can hit. Right. So they were close. They were within a couple of nautical miles from us, where a ship had been getting boarded by pirates, and they were absolutely desperate. They were crying for crying for help, and. Mm. Calling out into the radio at that distance, there is very little chance you'll get help. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, my father, in the absolute quick thinker that he is, uh, gets on the radio and fakes a conversation with an aircraft carrier. Oh wow! And he says, uh, "Yeah, the uh, the USS Missouri is going to be sending a helicopter over you. Just sit tight; they'll be there in a bit." And the pirates book it. Yeah. They don't I'll even take that. the time to humor yeah. this. And there's a bit, uh, there's a long silence after they said, oh my God, they're gone. Thank you so much. You saved us. This is great. Long silence. Wow. My mom looks over at my dad. Isn't the USS Missouri at the bottom of Pearl Harbor? My dad goes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't, I couldn't think of a name off the top of my head. Your parents are smart. <laughs> <laughs> That's a wonderful That's story. Wonderful. Yeah. yeah. All right. So we have a trailer oh, from, <gasps> uh, Yes, please. Oh, first, let's show what that the first had been. Link. My family, it would have been like, what? Yeah. Where? I'm I going the other way. You. I can't hear you. What? Lori's dad's here, and he's in the corner, <laughs> just nodding. He's yeah. Yeah. Bill's, yeah. Bill's yeah. Bill's yeah. Like, what, 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 yeah. Go, Ned. Talk but, louder. But, but look, I'm, we're sitting here at a at a desk with somebody who's got a pirate story. Pirate. <laughs> I think that's fantastic. All right, so let's go to the Ma Magus Algar store. If you guys oh, have that is, link, because I, uh, I want to uh, know how you're using the internet to promote what your what your your passion. This so is there it is. Go cool. take a look at the screen. So what do so people go here and what can they do and buy? Well, and um, uh, Magus Elgar being an audio drama, it's available on iTunes, Audible, and Bandcamp. But this is our Bandcamp website where you can get oh, some nice. extra stuff. 
Um, we've got the soundtrack as the OST on the far left. In the center, we've got the Magus Elgar Fancy Edition, where if you if you purchase the Fancy Edition, <laughs> it's it's slightly more expensive. It's fancier. But you get uh, you get the soundtrack, you get some bloopers, you get some behind-the-scenes sound effect, uh, behind-the-scenes stuff, and you also get some sound effects oh, that cool. I created that you can use under a Creative Commons license. Ooh, like a ringtone? More like a, like if you want the sound of like the dragon shooting fire lightning at somebody. Wow. I've, I've got that in there, like all mixed and everything for you to want. <laughs> <laughs> um, All right. So let's go to the YouTube. Let's go. <laughs> I was actually going to get it on Audible, so I'm glad I waited. Well, like I'm Audible, like, if you still have credits for it, you can still get it for free yeah. uh, with part of your monthly thing. And we are looking for reviews if you happen to listen Ooh, to it there. Okay, yes. okay. We would True. very much like to have them because most so, people like uh, Audible, uh, Audible is, is a little bit pricier because, you know, it's Audible. Yeah. Um, but if you already have like a, a an account with them, it's practically free. Right. Yeah. I have, um, I have a bunch of credits on there, so I was just going to get it on there. Uh, I, iTunes, Ooh, they've, they've They've got it there. Uh, Bandcamp, you can get a lot of the extra stuff. Okay. And it's a way for me to get the most support directly. Because oh, okay. uh, the nice thing about Bandcamp is that they don't they don't take a lot of, uh, they don't take a, a big chunk of the profits. Yeah. Okay. Good, good, good. Um, and like I have complete control over how much it costs and what's going oh, on over nice. there. Oh, you so don't work? have control over on Audible or anything? No, you don't really get to choose the pricing on that. They usually end up deciding it and they take like 75% of oh, everything. Nice. So you were able to overprice it yourself. Well, <laughs> I don't think, I don't, I honestly don't think. You know, think. it's tricky because you, <laughs> while we're talking about this, before we play the trailer, I just want to mention that Ooh, it's important hear, that hear. whatever, whatever you create, that you make it available wherever people happen to be used to going but there's different ways that the the content creator is compensated at these different places like in other words if you're selling like these bongos you make them available on amazon because everyone goes to amazon but you probably would make a lot less than if you had your own bongo website i would yeah. like these bongos and it's the yeah. same with any content that we create if if Bandcamp and and uh patreon and these sites make it more possible for people to receive you know a fair compensation but mm -hmm. you have to have it available on itunes and audible because that's where people are looking for content yeah yeah so and and trying to uh advertise through those can be a little challenging because a lot right. of times mm -hmm. people aren't really sure what they're looking for not yeah. to mention most people who listen to this kind of stuff mm -hmm. are so accustomed to listening to podcasts which are free yeah right. and they they look at something like ours and they're like well why would i listen to this because it's not free, yeah. therefore, why should I bother? Yeah. But the the key difference with this is that we've put an obscene amount of sound design into this. Also, I am I am regrettably paying this out of pocket, but I wanted to make sure that I brought my absolute A game to this mm -hmm. it as sounds possible. Great. Absolutely, sounds like, yeah. sounds amazing. I, right. I love the tra the trailer. Well, at first I thought it was a cartoon because the trailer is. Immaculate. It's beautiful. It, it does. I'll get to that in a moment. And, All right, let's actually. play the trailer. And then I found that it was an audio drama. I was like, oh, this is going to be great. Yeah, so you can I loved see it. that a lot of love has gone into this. So yeah. let's play the trailer. To the board! In the magical world of Hearth, there are wizards, there are sorcerers, and there are magi. And none of them know what they're doing. That's how the best spells are discovered. <laughs> Throw it at the wall and read the tea leaves. Or scorch mark. Witness the wonders of magic, science, and property damage in a radio drama of phantasmical proportions. Face my mastery over the elements! <laughs> Magus Elgar. Now available for download wherever audiobooks are sold. Listen to the first three episodes for free on YouTube. Wonderful. <laughs> I love mm -hmm. that. So tell us a little bit about how you pulled all this together. Like who's doing what? What voices are you doing? Who's helping you with storylines, character, okay. animation, etc.? Well, the story of this started out where I was working for Melody Gun at the time as a freelance sound editor with Hamed Hokumzade, who contacted me through my connections at Chapman University, where I got my degree. Oh, nice. Um, we worked together on a project before, and he really liked the kind of stuff that I did. Um, I had gotten nominated for like best sound editing for the film that we worked on together. So he said, why don't you come work with me? Um, as time went on and we were doing a lot of small uh, side projects and small contracts and the like, and they were starting to build their business, I got the idea of realizing I could still use all of my skills from Chapman as mm -hmm. a sound editor and make an audio drama again. But doing all that stuff, there is essentially no limit to the kind of scope that we could make for it. Um, we, we all had really professional sound design experience. We had a sound mixer, we had a composer, we had a dialogue editor and the like, all wrapped up into just two or three people. Um, 
So I approached him with this idea of making an audio drama, and he said, I don't know what that is. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, could you could you provide me a proof of concept? So I, I grabbed a bunch of my friends, dragged them into my bedroom, which was my professional studio recording site at the time, and we um, we made like a small, crappy 10, 15 minute proof of concept, which uh, fun fact happens to be episode four of the series. Oh, that's cool! Um, wow. But with with real voice actors, yeah. I, 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 I feel like I need no, to no, stress no. that you recycled it. Yeah, we uh, yeah. we recycled the script. Um, yes. So we, um, so I pieced everything together, but the one thing that we ended up having as a stop, uh, kind of stopped us cold was, uh, Hamed, who agreed to sign on as our producer says, where are you getting the money? Oh, yeah. That's oh, money. right. That's a big one. Yeah. Things cost money. Yeah. Pe- pe- people like money. Everything. I need to money. get the money. We're so, um, money. we're spending money right now. So uh, he was suggesting like a Kickstarter or uh, like a GoFundMe page or a Kofi or something like that. And I said, I don't want to do that. And he said, well, why not? Well, how about we do some advertising? Because I don't, I, I don't feel like an advertiser would be interested because we don't, they, nobody knows who we are. Nobody knows who I am. It was also that I was having at the time immense self-esteem issues with this project. Hmm. Mostly because the last time that I had directed something, it was an unbelievable, unmitigated dumpster fire (laughs) (laughs) that it it shook my confidence to the very core that, okay, I need to just not be in charge of anything. Just give me tape to cut and I will, I will live with that. I'll be fine with that. Yeah. Um, so I, I had, I essentially told myself, this is going to be my, my first, last and only chance to prove that I can direct something, that I can create something of my own design. So I I went to the bank and I pulled out all of my life savings and I Jeez. dumped it into this. Mm-hmm. And I I wanted to make sure that it was as, as good as possible. And the crazy thing about it is that all the people that had signed on with me, um, William Violenis, who plays Mekas Elgar, Christopher Moore, who plays Udo Malaki, uh, Sandra Espinoza, uh, who played Kaylee Fawn, Randy Nazarian, who plays Dr. Horatio, and so many others. Every, they listened to, they read the script, they listened to the proof of concept episode, and they say, this is going to be great. Mm-hmm. This is going to be fantastic. You have our complete support. Yeah, I love um, the trailer. What's astonishing is that we have so many of our actors who are still plugging the show. <laughs> they, they, I mean, some of them have like really bit roles in it, but they, they love everything about it so much that they keep trying to help make it a thing. Yeah. That's yeah. great. That's and great. we We're on the map. That's always good. It, it, to, it, it took is me it hearth, the land of hearth, the world of hearth, the, the world, world of hearth, hearth. which uh, as it turns out is banana shaped. <laughs> <laughs> oh. How convenient. We call it the planetain. <laughs> That's funny. Um, but like, uh, we we worked on this for for a couple of years. Like, of course, this had to be like a hobby thing. I had my day job and everything, and everybody else had their day jobs. Yeah. And when we finally released it, we we still weren't sure if people were going to like it. And that kind of trans. There's a, a little piece of that in the show itself, where a lot of the show is about the that magic is kind of a stand-in for the exploration of that creative drive you have okay. that yeah. the the elements kind of inspire you that help give you the means to kind of channel that magic out in your world but there are so many unknowns that make it scary will people like, like it see. will people be upset about it, it? will pirates. people yeah. will people not care Mm-hmm. And there's all all of the the tiny unspoken things that no no class, no course about writing or or drawing or mm-hmm. create or music craft can prepare you right. for those parts the of the creative process. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. I I of, firmly believe that like most of the thing that hinders people from kind of moving forward creatively is that fear. Is that like nobody a, will like it? Yeah. And then, so they would rather but, just not do it than and, than find out that nobody would like. They're them. afraid to be I, embarrassed. Right. Oh, yeah. As, to be embarrassed. as someone who has been pushing for the last three or so years trying to get this off the ground, I I regret to inform you 
that fear doesn't go away. Oh, damn. Because I'm sitting here right now, like talking about the show, gushing about it, but I am vibrating deep down inside mm-hmm. that, oh, maybe people are not going to like this. <laughs> oh. I think that what it is is that is that you're never sure whether or not people aren't reacting because they're not aware or or they're, oh, they're very much aware. They simply don't like it. You mm-hmm. just really never know whether or not, it, is it out there enough yeah. for people to have sampled it? Because from what I saw, if people knew about it they would love it that like that's your situation it's not that it's not good enough it's more than good enough Mm -hmm. and sometimes people question whether or not like i'm not maybe what i'm doing is good i'm just not good at promoting myself but or but then that fear that underlying fear of what if i promote myself fully and completely and i'm just nobody wants me yeah yeah you're just shouting into the void yeah and that's there's there's always going to be that fear but what's fantastic about it is that you run into so many people who believe in this project with you and it's Mm -hmm. that is a hard thing to fake yeah and then you know those those people are just like okay i'm just here for the paycheck and you can tell and never you should never give someone a hard time for being there just for the paycheck because everybody's got to do that kind of work Mm -hmm. the fact that they're willing to sit here and and go through that for that pay Mm -hmm. is respectable enough i've i've been in that situation many times i'm never going to give anybody crap for that yeah but the people that that really do believe in the project that really are are there and you could you could feel it Mm -hmm. and you could see it in how they talk and how they 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 gush about it (laughs) yeah um it's heartwarming it's really heartwarming that's when you know uh, that yeah because my this whole show is is a love letter to those audio shows I grew up with. Mm. It's a it's an exploration of my own idea of what fantasies would be like. And it's a really good excuse for me to make explosion noises into a microphone. <laughs> so how much That's of a exciting. world is there out there of audio dramas so that pe- it becomes something that people get used to <sighs> looking for? Hundreds. Really? Thousands. Mm-hmm. There are so many so many amazing audio dramas out there for, yeah. from sci-fi to nonfiction to to fantasies even stuff in the same venue as my show um there, there's a couple i've listened to uh, girl in space oz 9 sub uh um the copper heart uh newton's dark room all of these shows have their own level of passion going into it with various degrees of budget but they all have one thing in common, and that is that they so unbelievably care about what they're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, t- I talk to them a lot. Like we, we all like a lot of these uh, podcasts. They they talk to each other on Twitter and social media, and they all we all plug each other. We all try to advertise for mm-hmm. each other because we all want to see everybody like get it out there. Because the mm-hmm. the cool thing about oh, um, cool. the cool thing about audio dramas is that you're not competing. Mm-mm. For views, you're not competing because everybody has, every, everybody that is an avid podcast listener has hundreds of these things on their phone. Mm-hmm. They're yeah. always looking for content. They're mm-hmm. always driving to and from work or, right. or on some mariner's vessel fishing for crabs. Yes, listening. Yeah, I used to listen to the Thrilling Adventure Hour, and they would do a bunch of radio plays like Beyond Belief, which had. Um, uh, Paul F. Tompkins, and um, and it was about like two um, alcoholic mediums, and it was really cool. <laughs> that sounds amazing. <laughs> it was great. I really loved it. But it's like, but yeah, you're right. I mean, as somebody who listens to a crap ton of podcasts and a crap ton of audiobooks, it also plays into the fact that like sometimes you just need something new, you know? Yeah, but like I'll go through times where I can't listen to another podcast. I have to listen to something in its entirety. In its entirety. So and so I I'll listen to you know, radio plays or I listen to other stuff. So yeah, I mean, I don't, I personally believe that it's like everybody has their own spin on it. So it's like your spin is different than like somebody else who, somebody could do a, a similar thing about a magician or, or a scientific nature, but it's because it's their opinion, not your opinion. It's completely different. Yeah. And uh, a lot of these podcasts, they, they have this unbelievable privilege of being able to present this for free. Yeah. But, one thing about them that I feel like a lot of the listeners should be uh, really draw attention to it is that these people, they put a lot of their heart and soul into the project mm-hmm. and they are doing this and not like trying to charge you like a paywall like I unfortunately have to. Um, yeah. But 
but a lot of them, if you really truly respect the people that you listen to, if you're inspired by them, if you're if you're feeling it, if it's resonating with you, give them a tip or something. Yeah. Like they've they've <laughs> a lot of these people, they've got merchandise, they've got Patreons, they've got Kofis, like giving them a little tip yeah. just to let you establish that, hey, this has value. And you, you have you've value. created Definitely. something that people can listen to with their kids or their grandkids in the car. Absolutely. Yeah. So and that's yeah. that's fun to share. Yeah. I still I still laugh every yeah. time I hear them say that's right. how the best spells are made. Just throw <laughs> stuff in a wall. Like I, I love that. I love that line. Now you also run uh, and write tabletop RPGs like Dungeons and Dragons as a way to workshop ideas that eventually become shows or skits. Can yeah. Because so for those of us who are not who have never played one, you know, because so you're gonna have to noob this way down. I like, have no problem. Doing how that. does it work? I go to your basement. If I if I was to explain what a tabletop <laughs> RPG van. is, a tabletop RPG is an adult's way of playing pretend again. I love it. Now, when when you're a kid, you have all these little things of like you're playing Star Wars or cowboy or or um, uh, cow, ro- cops and robbers or anything like that. Well, if you but were a girl, you played house. I don't know. Does anyone still play House? Please comment. I don't no. know. Does anyone still the, play House? None of the, none of the Oregon, girls I grew up with. Oregon Trail. We yeah. played like House. They need to yeah. have that kind of and restriction. I'd be like, well, then I want to be the dad. <laughs> yeah, my. Because I want to go to work. And, yeah. But anyway, so I don't want to um, hang out. In the but the big thing about playing pretend was <laughs> that with kids, it was it was it was unstructured. There's like there, everybody just does their thing, and you end up running into that that one fat kid with the lisp who says, no, it doesn't happen that way because I've got this. Yeah. Oh. And, then, and everybody's yeah. like, we don't want to hang out with that kid anymore. <laughs> yeah. um, but that is essentially a, uh, what it is for adults now is that we have a book establishing those rules. Oh. Now, they can be varying degrees of complication. Like there's like a bunch of numbers and math to break it down. But then there's some simpler ones where it's just, you're, it's just a great way of doing improv. Okay. It oh. is it is a combination of a board game and performance improvisational oh, yeah. acting. It's sort of collaborative yeah. storytelling. It's collaborative storytelling where one person is setting is giving the setting mm-hmm. and the conflict, the, and uh, three to six other people are the 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 main characters, the protagonists that decide what happens in the story. Okay. The reason why I do that I do this to workshop a lot of my ideas because I have a lot of really cool um, setting ideas. But my my main problem that I have is that sometimes working through plot is really difficult. I am a what you would call a set piece writer. I, while I'm driving down the street, uh, heading to work or to some fast food joint that I probably shouldn't be going to, uh, I get this idea of a really cool scene. Yeah. Like let's say, oh, this uh, this this masked villain wants to reveal uh, that he wants to end all magic and he's he's telling it to this one person who's really doubting themselves that's a cool scene in my head yeah but i don't know how to get there yeah <laughs> i have to i have to work my way back oh, i have to true. work my way forward and try to find the pieces to get to that point yeah with role playing games i have those set pieces in mind and the players work their way towards it uh, for example, I have a campaign. I had a campaign. We we call them campaigns because they're like uh, little sessions that you go through, as little chapters in a story. Okay. Uh, uh, called the Seven Flag Sprint. It's a fictional setting with airships and like a steampunk kind of universe where all of uh, the known world is just a series of canyons that they have to like fly their airships through. Okay. Um, and one of my players had come up with an idea of a character who is a, a walrus man who is also a bard or a, a person that plays music for a living, uh-huh. living. And he uses a giant cello and plays it like a fiddle oh. <laughs> as his entertainment. Like I, I, I never would have considered doing that, uh, con- coming up with it. And his whole story is this progression between um, dealing with this rival who's extremely well-connected and also the deep-seated anger towards the prejudice of him being like this really big guy that nobody would think to be a performer. Well, oh, he, yeah. He's a walrus. He's, he's a well, walrus. Of course. Well, he's yeah. a walrus man. <laughs> Cuckoo could chew. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you, you end up running into a lot of players who have these, these unconventional and fascinating ways mm. of building these characters. Cause like a lot of these people who have been doing RPGs for a while have put some real fascinating thought into it. Uh, for example, uh, uh, one of, one of my uh, youngest players, 
Uh, he's a kid named Cody. Uh, he just got out of high school. And he, you can tell he really wants to write. Uh, but writing is a very is a big challenge for him because he doesn't have a, he doesn't have a lot of literary experience. But with role playing games, uh, I've been talking with him and, and workshopping ideas with him. Like, okay, well, what's this character about? How do they work? How do they oh, function? Awesome. Wow. And he he works on the idea and tries to expand it more and more. And I've been playing a game with him for about a year or two now. And I've been seeing a definitive growth in his writing ability, mm-hmm. in his his ideas for inspiration, um, and his willingness willingness to take feedback and explore That's what he can great. do with that character. So, like a lot of uh, the the one thing that I love about the role playing games is that as a DM or dungeon master or game master, if you want to call it that, I can <laughs> workshop ideas that may or may not work. Uh-huh. Workshop characters that may or may not function, and do voices for characters that may or may not function. Because mm-hmm. I do, I do voices. I I make props. I have uh, a television that broadcasts like puzzles and stuff for them to solve, and I play music, and I I get really into That's the performance. Cool. Uh, crazy for example, stuff. Uh, one crazy. character in Magus Elgar started off as just an NPC I built in a campaign a long time ago. Uh, Magus Sagari, who I play the voice for. And the voice sounds a little bit up in this region, where he actually sounds very intelligent, but also sounds quite adorable that he makes big puffy cheeks or something like that when he gets embarrassed <laughs> and goes really red because he's part chameleon or a, uh, mm-hmm. a Lacertus, as we call it. <laughs> Do you record your That's campaigns? Um, I've started. Wonderful. I, I've started. And um, I haven't released a lot of them, mostly because of the fact that I'm still dealing with the unfortunate... Uh, pitfall of a lot of uh, these RPGs where people tend to talk on, on top of each other. Right. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering for purposes of re- referencing, <laughs> referring back so that you're coming up with all these ideas. So I'm just wondering how you're remembering everything. I have. Well, I write a lot of the stuff down. Okay. Um, I write. Um, That's smart. One of my longest running campaigns, which is, had been wor- we've been working on it for like six years. Uh, called the quizzical capstones of Octon Frobichobi, <laughs> is uh, that old is bag. is two hundred pages long of just notes. Jesus. Um, Jeez, and man. well, like what's what's crazy is that like I put so much effort into it that some of my players have like fifty pages of backstory for their Jeez. characters yeah. because That's they've awesome. just been building it from the ground up. It's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. So that is cool. Sounds fascinating. That they that they want to write so much about it. That is yeah. really cool. I was gonna bring it around because That's I just great. I just remembered that um as a kid I used to play a lot at this guy's at this family's house and they had a log cabin in the back and we would play different versions of log cabin furniture. That was the <laughs> game we used to play so we found a log cabin. I will watch and- that show well into the night. <laughs> so I, I was always a table just because I could, I could just kneel and just lay there for a long period of time. Yeah, well, that's we, good we, yoga. We, we, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's just good we, yoga. That's practical. We had some uh, parties, parties in college in the seventies where we played log cabin syrup. We'll see. Uh, All right. So yeah. next. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Jamie was a hippie, and he went, and he lived in Key West, and he got up oh, to boy. all kinds of. Lots of trouble. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Log cabin syrup was just All the tipping point. It's, I imagine there's like at least 50 page of backstory to that. <laughs> there is. For the each syrup character. alone has 50 for pages. Each <laughs> but, for each um, log. <laughs> going back something that you mentioned earlier. That's fascinating. Okay. That's fascinating stuff. You had mentioned something about like, I looked at this and I said, I really wanted this to be an, I really was expecting this to be an animation. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I really mm-hmm. expected this to be an animation. Yeah. yeah. About that. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, Let's do it. The one criticism that I got about this show, the Mega Selga show, which I've been talking about all day, so, um, uh, <laughs> has been, this would be fantastic as a cartoon. That's the one thing that I always hear about it, and I'm like, well, I'm not a, dra- I'm not an artist, I'm not I, a drawist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you think you think it's a criticism? Well, it's, it's said, partly it criticism, but it's also a bit of inspiration. Absolutely. Yeah. I I adore cartoons. I've grown up with them. I've yeah. I wa- I still watch them as a regular part of my diet because the wonderful thing about cartoons is that in a lot of ways it is still a way for us to communicate in a way that we can't normally do with live action. Yeah. And I'm not just talking about for children cuz uh like there's children's programming that yes I do watch. Yeah. Um but there's plenty of adult uh, animations that are still out there. I'm not talking about adult stuff like like oh there's lots of cursing and like and f bombs and poop jokes. I'm talking about like mature 
animations that talk about really complicated stuff that adults yeah. don't deal with. Adult themes and adult themes and not like sexual themes. I right, mean right. themes like what do I do when I come back from college and still have to live with my parents? Yeah. What do I do if I'm an adult with two kids and don't know how to take care of them? Yeah. Stuff like that. I, I like I love animation because it, it it expresses it in such a beautiful way. And the cool thing about animation, in contrast to live action, is that if you look at co- a live action movie, it's always it's it's going to be a product of its times. Yeah. No matter how like because the no matter how fancy mm-hmm. the technology mm-hmm. is now, fifty years from now, it's going to look like a product of its times. Yeah. yeah. But animation That's does true. not have that restriction. It's yeah. true. True. You Very look at true. you look at Ducktales or Aladdin or Snow White mm-hmm. or Robin Hood or or All Fantasia. Dogs Go to Heaven or Fantasia. Yeah, mm-hmm. those are timeless. My girlfriend's yeah. niece is really into this movie called Epic, and I watched that and I was like, "That's Fern Gully." Yeah, so just- it's, it's basically <laughs> it's basically George Lucas's interpretation of Fern Gully. Yeah, I was just like, I was like, <laughs> oh, uh, really? I was like, so I I put on Fern Gully and I was like, we're gonna watch the we're gonna watch the real version here, okay? I, I you know for what it's worth, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're gonna go Thank to Facebook you. feed but, time. I appreciate it. And Facebook feed time comes to us from my friend Melinda Rubin. She's not only my friend, she's my Facebook friend. Ooh. Okay, so she posted, hopefully I attach this, I don't know, boys. All right, so she posted, Mr. Big sighting at the Burger Lounge Sherman Oaks, <laughs> which begs the question, do you guys post uh, celebrity sightings on social media? Because we live here in Hollywood. Do you guys post celebrity sightings on social media? No. no, I never have. I mean, I barely show up on social media in the whole, but it's also, I think the mistake with that is that maybe, maybe I might be a little too young, but the first thing that I think of is a, a very obscure character from Sonic the Hedgehog. And I think that's just an indication of how young I am and how out of touch I am with celebrities. Oh, like, like you could be like right behind one in line at CVS and not even know. You know, yeah. I think they'd appreciate that though. Cause I yeah. imagine there's a lot of celebrities that just want to be left alone. Oh, yeah, yeah, because yeah, whenever I, I run that. in, whenever I run into a celebrity, my immediate response is, "Okay, don't freak out." Well, they so are. my, so you know, <laughs> Jamie and I, and probably Lori too, like we we see a lot of celebrities just in what we do, and so when you see one, when you're not doing a thing professionally, and you see one, it's still kind of startling, and you still want to like yell and and point but you know w- since we we <laughs> encounter so many in our day-to-day you try to be subtle so here's a story okay. so i'm at the my favorite deli up the hill and uh we're walking in and out walks a reba mm-hmm. and <gasps> yeah right and i and I, my husband I, I i lean over and i'm being discreet and i whisper it's reba you know because that's my discreet voice yeah it's reba yeah and ronnie yells in her face, Reba who? Oh my God. And I'm like, how many Rebas are there? There's yeah. only the one. Yeah. It's Reba McIntyre, if really? you must know. And she was just smiling at him because she's nice. But yeah. anyway, so yeah, you have to be subtle because you don't know how the people around you are going to react when you alert them to the celebrity in your presence. I remember I was on the second date with my girlfriend and we were at this movie um, called Unsane. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, my, uh, I had walked in and my, I noticed that my groundlings teacher was in the audio, was watching Ooh. the movie. Ooh. So I sent her a text message saying this text is coming from inside the movie theater. And then like, <laughs> thought that she would like respond to it, but like realized uh-huh. that she had turned off her phone like a normal person. Uh-huh. And so I had to wait the whole movie <laughs> for her. So then I was like, well, I'm going up to her. Cause it, at the time I thought she was ignoring me. Who was it? It was, uh, so she, my Groundlings teacher was sitting next to Jennifer Coolidge. Oh. And so I literally walk up to her and I was like, I was like, did you see my text? Because I was like being a dork and uh-huh. not not to my Groundlings teacher, Chase, but not to the. And then all of a sudden I see Jennifer Coolidge and I was like, I'm fans of yours for a long time. <laughs> so just sort of backing well away. Said. And then she was like, oh, I think you're, I heard about you from Chase. I think you're really, uh, she told me that, and I was like, oh my God, thank you so much. And then like, she started walking and then I was walking and then I walked with her into the bathroom and then I realized, oh, I don't have to go to the bathroom. But right. I was like, I can't make her think that I went in there just to, to, get just away. to talk to yeah. her. So I went and sat in the bathroom 
and then got up and left. And then I realized, no, I actually do have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> wow. And then I went to the bathroom. So this is a long, up. engaging story. Ask yeah. me who my Groundlings teacher was. Who was your Groundlings teacher? Kathy Griffin. Oh, wow. <laughs> what? Up and down, yeah. up and down. Did she, wow. tell, did she tell just as long stories as I did about meeting celebrities and how they... <laughs> she did. <laughs> she rambled very she similar. She did all the voices. <laughs> <laughs> a similar ramble. She'd follow me into the bathroom. <laughs> some people rant, some people ramble. I, I ramble. <laughs> so, Jamie, because you know, yeah. you're already friends with a lot of celebrities. Yeah. So if you see like an extra, like a bonus celebrity, let's say, at, at Ralph's, will you try to take their picture down the aisle and then post it to social media? No. No. No, my yeah. God, I would never do that. No, I respect well, that, their that, space. See, like, but what I Melinda did them. is okay. She didn't even use his real name. She called him Mr. Big. <laughs> So she was being <laughs> but, but we subtle. know. Well, I, mean, I know, some, but she didn't take a... Did she take a picture? She didn't take a picture. No. Okay. She was some just like... Just she, didn't just invade his, yeah. she didn't invade his space, really. She just yeah, went on social media and, worse. you know, texted, posted something that she observed in the world. And you can't fault her for that. If I, that's what she needed to do. She needed to do it. She needed to do it. Yeah. And because she was excited, she needed to share it with somebody. Yeah. You know, there was nobody there for her to go, oh my God, look at that. You know? Right. So, so she did her, oh my God, look at that. Exactly. On social media. I think the key and word from Yeah, her. it's just, I, I know too, too many people, I just respect that. And I think, I, go ahead, Kennedy. Yeah, I, ahead. I think the key word from that is, is really consent in a lot of it because yeah. mm -hmm. um these people get bombarded with paparazzi yep. all the time yep. their their lives have been they've they've willingly rel uh, they've willingly relinquished their their public lives to the masses and allowing to have them a little bit of control over when they want to put on that face that's yeah is is only just out of respect for them yeah um I've, like i think everybody's got their one uh, they, at one point, they might have a their their that time I ran into a celebrity story. Mm -hmm. I've got one myself. Um, when I was going to the audio publishers audio awards in March, because uh, we got nominated for best original work for Magus Elgar, wow. I had the That's rare awesome. opportunity to meet LeVar Burton. <gasps> Oh my God! Uh, for oh. those of you who aren't familiar with Lavar Burton, uh, oh, he's sure the uh, he plays uh, Jordy LaForge in Star Trek: The Next Generation, and is also the main host for Reading Rainbow, Rainbow back in the yeah. day. That's right. Now, um, I see this guy walk in, and I get I, I get butterflies in my stomach, mostly because the entire fact that I'm in this really big prestigious environment is sending me to cloud nine in the mm -hmm. first place. Sure. And uh, I had William Violenis and Sandra Espinosa flanking me at the the award ceremony and they're like he's right there <laughs> just go to him and i'm like no i don't want to i do but i don't <laughs> so then um what was funny was that one of the other people in my category for the best original work uh, mark bender who wrote the book uh loki ragnarok and was getting nominated oh, in the same wow. as we me comes up to me introduces himself and he says LeVar Burton's over there. And I go, yeah, I know. I don't know what to do. And he goes, come with me. I'm going to be your wingman. <laughs> Wing, wingman. Yeah. So, so we go up to LeVar Burton. And of course, uh, as soon as he opens his mouth, he, he's speaking in his LeVar Burton Speaks uh, podcast voice where it's like, it's a pleasure to meet you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I hope that you're having a good time here. Is this your first time here? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, and I said, you know, it's like I wanted to, I, you know, I, 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 I'm like, okay, play it cool, play it cool. I really want to thank you for uh, introducing, like, for for doing the whole thing with reading Rainbow and trying to bring it back and teaching me how to read. I taught you how to read. No, uh, no I, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> that, that didn't come out right. May I like, follow mm -hmm. you into the bathroom and explain <laughs> yeah. further? Like, thank you, thank yeah. you for reading stories to me, Mr. Burton. Oh, that's so cool. Uh, but, uh, that's a nice that story. That's really cute. But, well, but pl I, well played, Kennedy. Well but played. I, I, I end up telling him, like, well, um, this is my first time here. It's like, oh, well, what'd you do? Oh, my, is this happening? <laughs> oh. Uh, yeah, I, I made an audio dramas. It's a comedy. Do you have anything for it? I have the I have these cards. You give that to me. <laughs> really? Oh, nice. And you gave it, it to him. His, I gave it to him. He stuffed oh it in his God, pocket. Oh my God, that's awesome. I have no idea if he's listened to it at any point. Hey, you took one. Yeah. All right, I'm we're sure going to move. That's, hopefully, Lavar is listening. And Watching hopefully. and listening today. Uh, we're yes. going to go on Hi, to LeVar. what's Twitter trending I, today. Yep. What was Twitter trending is hashtag White Lies We Tell, and we have a tweet from Jan with a band. Jan with a band tweeted uh, hashtag Lies We Tell. Go ahead, Jamie. 
I didn't get your text. I think that's pretty typical. And like, do people believe that people are going to believe that? Because if you texted it, then they probably got it, right? A lot of it has to do with reputation. I mean, there's there is that little uh, there's that little mark now, like these little tiny check marks, where it's like, ah, they definitely read it. Yeah, mm-hmm. but, but then um, you figure out a way to do it on like a people who say that. I go to like Instagram or Messenger where it shows that they saw it. So I'm like, well, you did get it. Yeah, well, you can set your text to to where the person would you would know if the person read it or not or something no you Wait. have to do it you no, have you to can do change it. it you can change it has this to be, yeah. you uh, have yeah. to sh- you can edit it so it takes off that you saw it but you can't i want say. them like i like teenage girls will say i want them to know i read it and didn't respond it oh yeah <sighs> that's the i want preference. to make them sure think, that they yeah. know that they I don't any woman. to me and people <laughs> my age are like no that's that's too much i think <laughs> across <laughs> the board any woman has that because the whole like my whole text to kick question um, to you guys is like okay. because your phone is always with you if someone texts you are you expected to reply immediately like and how long is is considered within the within the bubble of courtesy to wait it depends on the person i mean my dad I, when he he'll text me please call me and i'll usually give it about 48 hours okay but if he it, says if right. he can call me right now i'll give it like 12 hours oh it's also, right now. Critical. also yeah. like the relationship with you and the person like is it work family friends like i feel like that also yeah, yeah if like, i'm in the lot, middle of like something else i and i just can't are you supposed to just text back i can't text you right now yeah i mean yeah. that's that's, yeah. that's very permissible a lot oh, of it comes down to reputation that. too yeah well, like that's true. how much you know about the person and, and their their habits like uh, my my roommate has the worst telephone on the planet. So if you text him, there is a thirty percent chance he's going to answer that thing because a lot of the times it just doesn't go through. Uh, and you you have to yeah. you have to you go into that knowing that he's probably not going to respond even if he's seen even if he has seen it. <laughs> yeah. Also, it's like group text too. Like sometimes my mom doesn't have an Apple phone, so sometimes when we send out group texts, everybody else but her. To, right. will get it but then she won't get it if they don't have if there's one in there without the apple phone it shows it throws off the whole dynamic yeah the the, really? the uh, algorithm no, is like mm-hmm. i'm confused those green-eyed mm-hmm. bastards and yeah so um one more from <laughs> those green-eyed bastards megan walton tweets uh sorry that was my last piece of gum this is a lie this is a lie that she tells so uh yeah i mean i think it's reasonable to say it was my last piece of gum even if it wasn't you just don't want to give them any gum Right? Yeah. yeah. I, I see I'm that sorry, I don't have any spare change. I All would right. see that happen more with cigarettes, too. I find that a lot of times people, like, I'll be with friends or something, and they'll be like, and, like, my friend Colin will be like, oh, hey, do you have a cigarette? And, you know, he'll, he'll be like. Lie. He just asked for a cigarette? I always ask for a pack. No, I don't. I mean, I'm just not. An entire pack? pack. I just ask for a lung because it's pack? faster. Yeah. Like, just Can give I get me a lung. Can I get but a lung? But it's just like, it's weird to me that people go around asking for individual cigarettes. Well, like, they do because like, that's how the Jones is. It's like you got to have smoke. It. Yeah. Got to have it. But yeah, I'm always that's outside a terrible with addiction. comedians. So comedians are always smoking. and people, Comedians are always They'll be smoking. like, oh, do you have a cigarette? And I'm like, no, I don't. I don't have. I don't smoke. And they'll be like, and go up to my friend Colin and be like, do you have a cigarette? And he literally just pulled out like a pack of cigarettes. And he'll be like, no, I don't have any. This is my last one. And I'll be like, you just pulled out a pack of cigarettes. Well, they're expensive. <laughs> cigarettes are now expensive, yeah. Very expensive. So yeah. where can we find you online and Magus and everything that, about you that we need to find? Well, I'm absolutely rubbish at social media, but I do have a Facebook. I do okay. have my website. My website, the uh, uh, KennedyPhillips.org is like my work website where you can like send emails of like, if you need sound work or other things oh, like sure. that, or if oh, you want nice. sure. my velvety dulcet tones into whatever it is that you're working on, I can of man. course provide it. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm also um, at Magus Elgar uh, for Twitter. Mm-hmm. Oh, um, cool. We're on Facebook with Magus Elgar. You could also go to MagusElgar.com where you can see little bits and bobs of <gasps> There's cool you winning things. an award. Oh, that's cool. Oh, is that f- the sound award? Not that, that pictured the LeVar hundred, Burton. The 100 yard that dash. That was the uh that was my nomination for uh best original work. Oh, oh congratulations. Nice. Probably one of the proudest works I have on there. I'm unfortunately looking like a total great. goober on that picture though no. because my hair's all over the place. No, no, no. no that's <laughs> But yeah, we're on we're on we're on Twitter. I like uh, it. Bad I'm head. kind of posting random bits and bobs and jokes and things like that on occasion. Uh-huh. Um usually talking talking with a bunch of other people and talking about other big things that we're working on. You know, stuff of what's going to happen in the future for Mega Elgar. That's really great. That's that cool. is wonderful. We will check that well, out. That, that's, I mean, you say you're not good at social media. I was that's, just thinking. That's yeah. fine. Yeah, we see that's tweets. That's good. You know, we see, we see messages and tweets and, and anybody who is uh, attracted to it. Now, you know, you talked about 
uh, attracting people to it. And, you know, I think that's all in the in the character development, isn't it? It's, it's making the characters likable and, and making them, you know, you want to revisit them. You want to, you care about you them. You want to know what happens. You want to know what yeah. happens. Yeah, you well, know, a, lot of it, the way, a lot of it does also come to down to leaving an impact. Because there's plenty of unlikable characters out there that we, we keep coming back to to want to yeah. see what happens. Oh, yeah. I mean, Breaking look at Game Bad. of Thrones. Oh, it's like Breaking tons Bad. of unlikable characters you want to see what happens yeah. to them. Um, so there's various messages well, that you portray throughout it. Well, it really depends on the kind of character you're trying to play. Like, um, mm-hmm. something that I, I had did with my characters was, um, I, as you were mentioning about animation... I'm working on making Make Zelgar animated and That's seeing great. how Absolutely. well they translate on the screen to leave that kind of an impact. I actually have like a photo of like some concept art uh, lying around here somewhere. I'm not It'll sure if you've got it. It'll be fantastic. I love the, the images, the, um, the, the, uh, the fonts that you have and the meaning, the meaning of the, where, where was that? Where did I see that? A I, lot of that comes to uh, uh, my graphic designer and some design choices and other things like that. Um, I have a, a really character designer meaning. that's been working on some things. That's damn near animation. Yeah. Like if it you really check is. out um, up there, like we've got like all this concept art. I think there's one where there's like a lineup. Yeah. That, that bottom right one right there that we've been uh, oh, showing what these characters cool. look like now for this animation. Uh huh. All right, we have to say goodbye. I'm so sorry we're out of time. I want to thank Kennedy for being with us. Thank you, uh, you. Thomas Hubble. It's okay. uh, Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Dina Friedman, John Maddox, Bill Filippiak, Steve Joyner, Michigan Sports and Entertainment Networks. Thank you, Jamie Alcroft. Thank you, Lori Roggenkamp. Thank you, Bill Roggenkamp. And I want to say especially to Tim Conway, Doris Day, Uh. and my very own Margaret Singer, go be with God, and thank you for sharing your art with us. Thank you. Thank you.